Hello and welcome to Shankism episode 25, The Black Death and 100 Years of War. It's a very fitting time to be doing this episode on the plague, so let's get right into it. The Plague and the Hundred Years War is what you want to title your next section. All right, this is during the late Middle Ages, so we're roughly going from around 1250 AD range, 1300, probably more like 1300 to 1500. So we'll be talking about the Black Death and the Bubonic Plague is the same, it's the same thing. So let's talk about it. So the deadly disease spreads by rats, but the fleas that were on the rats, to be more particular, to be more precise, as you see here, the rat carries it, carries the flea from China, Asia, into Europe. This all happened around 1346 to 1353 is when it kind of became really involved, like a seven to eight year period in Europe when it was at its most intense. So you do want to write that down, that it's the disease itself is spread by fleas that are on rats. Again, it starts in Asia, it starts in China, much like this coronavirus started in Asia, and it shifts towards Europe, right? By about 1347, so you're looking at around 670 years ago, they had the same thing going on that's going on now, was going on then. Now, not to the degree because what's going on now is nowhere even close to the bubonic plague. Nowhere close to the black plague. You know, this is epic proportions where they don't know what's going on. They don't know where it's coming from. It's killing one third of the population and quickly it's very contagious. And science is, and medicine is not what it um, is now. Those would be the plague doctors, as you'll see. Okay, they wear those masks, put them with the herbs and so forth to kind of uh, weed out the disease. They didn't know if it was airborne. They didn't know how you could exactly contract it. But that was the best method. And kind of when you saw this, this kind of meant someone's infected and someone's probably going to die. But, I mean, the doctors would give you a better chance at living, but not much better. You know, some of their best, best methods would be to just let the blood out, like let the evil blood out. You know, so basically drain some of the blood. Origins and symptoms. So the plague gets its name from the black spots that appear on the skin. Called Uranusia pestis. The plague was most likely transmitted via fleas on a rat. Coming from ships crossing the Black Sea. If you know where the Black Sea is at. Hopping on board there and traveling to Europe. Being around rodents and things like that is not uncommon. This is something that would happen a lot. You'd be around rats. You'd be around animals consistently. The Jews throughout Europe were blamed for the plague. Many were killed in an attempt to end the disease. So again, you have minority groups when fear and logic, uh, when fear takes over and logic just goes away, people go to minorities. They look for somebody to blame. They look for a scapegoat. Oh, it must be the Jews' fault. They said that they were poisoning the water wells and that was making people sick. So they're wiping out sometimes whole, you know, villages and communities of Jewish people because they thought that that would get rid of the disease. Many saw this as a punishment from God, that they had been bad, they had not been loyal and not been, you know, going to church enough and they saw that this is God punishing them. When the church was unable to stop the plague, many people lost faith in the church. People are looking for help. They're not really getting it from doctors. Doctors aren't that great at this point. As you can see, a plague doctor there, they're okay. But many people turn to the church, you know, and turn to the Pope. and Hey, save us, priests. Save us, Pope. Save us, bishops. They couldn't do anything. They would pray, and, and it didn't matter. The, the disease was so brutal, it just it would kill you within three days or less or more, a little bit more, but probably around three, average is three. So they lose faith. Out of the contracted disease, of all who contracted, only 25% of them survived. So if you got the disease, there's a 75% chance that you're going to die. T 
today if you get the disease coronavirus typically like the fatality rate is like two to four and typically that's if you're older than 70 okay not uncommon that somebody younger could catch it but uncommon if they would be in critical condition and die from it effects of the plague so what did the plague do how did it affect the people living during the 1340s and 50s so is a decline in the birth rate because you're not going to have kids because you're bringing them into a world that you can you can't really support you don't want to bring them into a world where they probably will die you don't you're you're already trying to care for your kids to begin with you don't want to bring in more that you're going to have struggle to to take care of town populations will decrease immensely because people don't want to live close together they want to get a, they want to get even further apart that's just kind of the social distancing that's going on right now that's what they needed to do so town populations as they started to rise before this because the crusades and a lot of other things were helping europe get out of that dark age this kind of puts them back unfortunately back so you'll have trade trade will decline because people don't want to interact with people or ship goods and you don't know if it's carrying the disease or not. Religious tolerance, you know, I told you they were destroying communities of Jewish people, killing Jews, you know, persecuting Jews throughout history. They have been the scapegoat. When anything goes wrong, let's blame the Jews. The church, people did lost faith, like I said. They just didn't believe in God anymore. God, why was God punishing them? This is their thought. An increase in social change because of this, you have peasants getting more rights you have people getting more rights because who's ever left they are now in charge they are now can fight for better wages because there's less competition because there's less people and there's a higher demand for certain products and they can kind of say hey i won't i won't give you this here i mean some of them are taking advantage of that situation you know kind of like what you saw here some people were buying up germex and cleaning supplies and then selling them for astronomical prices there is a high demand there, but it's very unethical to do that because people need those products. You know, not only individual people, but hospitals need those products and so forth. The value of labor went up. You know, the serfs demanded the higher wage for their work, so the value of the labor that they were doing went up. So they were getting paid more. Lots of peasant revolts. Uh, landowners will seek. But let's talk about the Hundred Years' War. All right, that's the bubonic plague in a very short nutshell. The Hundred Years' War, the last Capetian, which is French, we learned about Hugh Capet, dies without a successor, so the person that would take his spot, who would take the throne. War of French Succession. Again, it's a conflict between England and France over the French throne. It begins around 1337, so around 10 years before the plague, and it won't end until 1453, and I understand the math here. It's not a hundred years exactly, but it's an on and off again fighting between. All right? The war starts when the last Capetian king dies without an heir. The king of England claims a right to the throne. He is a distant nephew of the former king. Though England wins many battles, France will eventually win the war. That's important. So you know it's versus France versus England, and France will end up winning. But didn't look like that because England was winning many wars. Now, during the Hundred Years' Warfare, will change. Less focus on chivalry, so that, you know, if you remember chivalry, the code of conduct for knights, you know, a lot of times the knights in battle, they are so well armed, they wouldn't really die. They just basically would be subdued by another knight, and they would be going to fight another day. Right? There was a code of conduct between the two, uh, if you're a French knight, if you're an English knight, and so forth. Okay, that code of chivalry. Well, weapons of the period begin to reflect this. They didn't care about chivalry anymore. They're like, whatever, you know. A knight wouldn't throw sand in someone's eye in order to get the upper hand. It would be a formal combat. But times changed. Knights were not only soldiers on the battlefield. So now it's not just knights fighting. It, these are peasants that are being trained to fight as well. So now you have a huge population of foot soldiers. But you don't also ju just want foot soldiers, you want also archers. And there's a specific kind of archer, which you'll see here. The big battle here is the Battle of Agincourt in 1415. It's a very famous battle of the Hundred Years' War. 
Henry V leads his outnumbered troops to victory. Right? Um, he's an English, Henry's an English king, so the English win this. All right? Uh, Treaty of Troyes is uh, uh, supposed to end the war after Charles VI dies. Is the longbow. As you see in the top portion there, they start using the longbow. This is what I mean by the battles change. So this longbow is about six feet tall. So it's about as tall as I am. All right, And you can shoot it long, long distances. It took years of training to do this, years of training and practice to become a longbowman. And it was seen as cowardly. It was seen as, you know, violating the code of chivalry because, you know, you have knights that are just standing there and all of a sudden an arrow pierces their chest and goes right through their chest plate. Most of the arrows, because there's such force behind it, would pierce anybody, anybody's armor. And the knights, uh, the French knights, were incredibly upset about this. This is, you know, this English longbow. They thought that these, the English were cowards, especially the ones that have these longbows. So, so when the French would catch these English longbowmen, maybe imprison them, they would cut off a particular finger, okay, it, your middle finger. All right. So look at your middle finger, and they would cut it off, and they would taunt. And I won't give you the actual finger. I'll give you a. I'll give you. So see my fingers here. I'll give you this finger, all right? And this is not the finger they'd be cutting off, but they would cut off this finger so that way they would taunt the other Frenchman saying, hey, ha, 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 I've got your finger, basically a giant. That's kind of how the origin of flipping the bird and so forth, it was, you know, kind of showing your disdain, your disgust, but they could no longer be their longbowmen. You needed that finger um, to do it. But they were considered cowards, that's why they did it. Now I'll have a certain guest talk about the next portion of the Hundred Years' War. Good evening to the students, viewers, and listeners of Shankism. My name is Mr. Woods. I'm a former colleague of Mr. Shanks, who has so uh, graciously invited me on to his show to discuss a famous hero of the Hundred Years' War, a young woman named Joan of Arc. So Joan has a pretty interesting story, uh, and I'm going to try to keep it short, but uh, she's very, very in-depth character uh, and person from history to talk about. So let's jump right in. Joan was born sometime in the year 1412. Now, we don't know exactly when because she was of relative unimportance in the French countryside. She's an illiterate peasant girl living in the town of Dormery, which is um, kind of southeastern France in a village that is, you know, roughly nothing on the grand stage. She begins receiving visions uh, around age 16. She has visions from uh, several saints, including St. Michael, who ask her to live a pious life, and they go on to tell her to put Charles of Valois, who would become Charles VII, on the throne of France. Now, this is a a pretty tumultuous time in France during the Hundred Years' War. In fact, the throne of France had been promised to the English king Henry V, who died before he could take it, and his son, Henry VI, who was an infant, should have inherited the throne. Now, fast forward to Joan's time, and she's receiving these visions. Now, we might think of that today and go, well, that's just, you know, that's just... Uh, madness, but in Joan's time, this wasn't completely out of the norm. So, Joan follows up on these visions, uh, and she goes to Chinon, which is the location of the king or of Charles the Valois at that point. And one of the first kind of tests of her mysticism is that she is able to pick the king out of a crowded room during his ball. Now, it's not like today where we've seen our president; and we know what they look like. Joan would have had no real idea what the king looked like. Um, and he was purposely trying to deceive her. So her ability to locate him was seen by many as, you know, a display of her mystic ability. Joan goes into conference with the king, and basically they come out of this meeting with the decision of, you know, going forward, trying to prove her uh, ability, her connection with God, and her ability to um, go out and do what she's promised she could do, which is 
put him on the throne of France. Joan is asked to prove this, this power she has, and she asks to go to the city of Orléans, break the siege. Now, this is something that, you know, nobody thought anyone could do. At this point, the French are losing the war, and it looks like it's all going to be over soon. So Joan goes to Orléans, manages to get inside the city, and is basically cut out of everything. The leaders of the, the French forces inside of Orléans don't want anything to do with her, and so she's you know, not really in the position of command or understanding what's going on. On May the 4th, she has a vision, and St. Michael appears to her, telling her to you know, go out and attack the English. So she rushes out, uh, her men rush after her. Joan has this, this quality of inspiring leadership. Rush out onto the battlefield and they catch an English attack. Immediately turn it into a counterattack. Joan rushes out onto the, this bridge, plants her standard, and is able to rally the troops. They push the English forces back and begin taking uh, like castle locations in the region, uh, like battlefield hubs, over the next couple of days until they've actually officially broken the siege of Orléans. In the meantime, Joan took an arrow uh, to the shoulder and was wounded, but she still is out there kind of inspiring the troops. And that's really probably one of the more interesting things that really becomes a quality of Joan. She's not a front lines warrior, but she is an inspiration. She is La Pucelle, the maiden. Uh, and that's the name or the title that she'll take on afterward. She'll be known as the Maiden of Orléans. So after she's broken this siege, she she takes Charles to to uh, Rome, which is like the major city. France, it's the city of kings. And it's where he's meant to take his throne. Joan works to cut a path for the king to travel there safely and manages to get him his crown. Now, over the course of this, there were several small battles that Joan's soldiers took part in. Uh, Joan had a bond with her troops. She dressed as a man, which was kind of part of this, the times of one blending in and, and two building the camaraderie with the men. She, you know, walked among her soldiers and she had this rapport with her troops to where they, they would not loot and pillage and they would follow her, basically her command, uh, almost to anything. Joan gets Charles crowned, kneels before him, acknowledges him as her king, and it's this real kind of, um, kind of pinnacle moment. And that is when Joan's visions stop, uh, because she's you know achieved what she set out to do. Joan goes on to uh, continue to fight for France. She uh, is trying to take the city of Paris, even though uh, King Charles VII at this time, as he'd be known, is in peace talks with the, the French Burgundians who had allied with the, the English, and there's all of this other fighting going on. Now, in May of that year, which is uh, 1429, Joan is knocked off of her horse and allows herself to be captured. The Burgundians try to ransom her to the English, uh, or try to ransom her to the French king, who ignores her. Uh, Charles VII pretty much has disowned Joan at this point. Now, there's a lot of speculation as to why, but part of it could be that he was messing up her peace, or that she was messing up his peace negotiations. Others could be he you know, sort of got what he needed out of the, the relationship and was done. Since the French won't take her, the Burgundians turn to the English, who are happy to take Joan and put her on trial. There was over uh, 70 different charges drawn up against Joan, including heresy. Uh, one of the major ones is actually cross-dressing. Uh, that she's dressing as a man. English theologians try to um, trip Joan up in her knowledge of of the Bible and of of uh, kind of the mysticism that she has. Uh, they torture her. Um, she is beaten. She is starved. She's kept in you know this this you know, uh, stereotypical dungeon. And life is pretty miserable for Joan for for about a week. Uh, over the course of this this period. Uh, eventually, they force her to sign a confession, uh, and part of the provision of that is that she'll be allowed to live as long as she never wears men's clothes again. And then her captors force her to wear men's clothes, leading to her uh, execution. So May 30th of 1431, Joan is burned at the stake, 
in Rouen, France, which was under English control. Then her ashes are gathered and burned again and scattered into the river. Now, a few years after this, Charles VII will, will have taken back most of that region of France, pushed the English out. He'll open up an inquiry into Joan's trial, where you know uh, this will make it all the way to the Pope. The Pope will nullify uh, most of the charges brought against Joan. They will the, the papal um, council will declare her a martyr. And in May of 1920, so yeah, you know, I mean we're talking almost 500 years later. But in May of 1920, Joan is canonized by Pope Benedict the the 15th as a saint. So Joan goes from one end of the spectrum to the other, from being a heretic to a saint. I want to share this uh, this reading that I have here, uh, which are some of the words of Joan. Now she commonly wrote letters, and in this letter she's actually addressing the king of of England, um, which you know for for an illiterate maiden to do or you know have somebody address this letter to the king, it's just kind of throwing it in there into his face. But you know, skip that she runs down through all the regents and lords. But essentially she's telling the king and, and all of the nobility to uh, do right by the king of heaven, to hand over to the maiden who is sent here by God, the king of heavens, the keys to all the towns which you have taken and violated in France. She, referring to herself, has come here in the name of God to support the royal family. She is quite prepared to make peace if you are willing to do right, so long as you give up France, and make amends for occupying it. And your archers, soldiers, both noble and otherwise, who are around the town of Orléans, in God's name, go back to your own lands. And if you will not do so, await word of the maiden, who will go to see you soon, to your very great misfortune. O King of England, if you do not do so, I am a commander, and wherever I come across your troops in France, I shall make them go, whether willingly or unwillingly. If they do not obey, I will have them wiped out. I am sent here for the God, the King of Heaven, an eye for an eye, to drive you entirely from France. Now, those bold words for a, uh, at that point, like a 17-year-old girl to address the King of England. So, in closing, uh, Joan is this remarkable person for her time because she's exercising power outside of her field of influence, and she's really able to turn the tide of France, and, and even today she's a national hero in France. So it just goes to show you, I suppose, that with the right amount of will and effort, you really can do anything. So this has been Mr. Woods. I'm glad that uh, Mr. Shank invited me on his show, and I hope to speak to you all again soon. The effects of the war. Uh, so nationalism, nationalist ideas emerged in England and France, which is what you would write down. All right. So they saw themselves that after this war, we are France. We are England, not like a collection of territories or small kingdoms or, you know, we're a whole entire, we're a nation state, not a city state, not a kingdom. We're a legitimate country now. The English enter a period called the War of the Roses. So this, right after this, right after the Hundred Years War, England goes into its own civil war. Power and prestige of France will grow. So both countries get a big boost in their uh, morale, their nationalism, their patriotism. The power of the king grows. Uh, the age of faith wanes and secular rulers begin to have more influence. So kings begin to have way more influence than any pope or religious leader would. Chivalry is dead after this era. There's no more chivalry. So people say that chivalry died you know, in modern times. Chivalry died after the Hundred Years' War because of the the age of the new warfare all right you know using longbows and not caring about you know being cordial on the battlefield but let's talk about that war of the roses right, from 1455 to 1487. the war of the roses is an english civil war so the hundred years war is when france and england were fighting and france won but the english will then right after start fighting their own civil war over the throne this one's super complicated, but I won't get into much detail about it. But just know that it's an English civil war. It's an English civil war. 
and that kind of starts to tear the country apart, right? You have noble families that are involved, the Lancasters and the New Yorks, both are descended from Henry I of England. Their family crest, Hell Roses, hence the name. That's why it's called War of the Roses, as you see in the picture. So your crest, your family crest, uh, would have these type of different, maybe roses in this case. Uh, Lancastrian King Henry VI had economic struggles under the Hundred Years' War. He's surrounded by dissidents, displayed moments is surrounded by dissent, displayed moments of mental illness, uh, civil disagreements, lords, and private armies are all set up. The Duke of York becomes King Edward VI, passes his son, Edward V. Parliament decides he is illegitimate, locked in a tower of London. Henry Tudor, Earl of Richmond, defeats Yorkist King Richard, Battle of Bosworth Fields, becomes King Henry the seventh marries Elizabeth of York, begins the Tudor line. This has been episode 25 of Shankism, the Black Death in 100 Years of War. Stay safe out there.